<clears throat> a very warm welcome to this talk my name is dr Said kazmi and you are watching my youtube channel and the topic for discussion today is known as intussusception yes intussusception uh, this word is a bit difficult to pronounce in medical terminology but uh, nevertheless my uh, doctor friends would know it very well so let's start with the definition so intussusception is basically telescoping of a part of an intestine into itself now it is one of the most common abdominal emergency in young children less than two years of age and it is considered to be the most common cause of a small intestine or sometimes even large intestine obstruction or let me call it bowel obstruction in children now it is it can happen in adults as well though it's a bit rare and if it happens in the adult then it should prompt concern for cancer uh, but usually in pediatrics the uh, typical age is 6 to 36 months you can say like 6 months to almost 3 years of age now 90% of the pediatric population falls within this age group uh, well I mean uh, their children can be affected out of, uh, outside of this age but uh, that's a bit like rare as I told you that most of them would be uh, falling between this age bracket of uh, 6 months to uh, 3 years now uh, coming down to the pathogenesis like why it happens now remember this is telescoping of one part of the intestine into the so if this is intestine one part just moves into the other one now the most common location where it happens is the ileocecal junction that occurs in almost 90 percent of the cases so where the e terminal ileum is entering the uh, large intestine that we call as the ileocecal junction most of the cases occur there and then overwhelmingly about 75 percent of uh, the pediatric cases are idiopathic with no identified by uh, masses and no lead points now what is lead point i will uh, explain in a moment uh, but as i told you there are no identified mass while in adults most of them would be caused by masses that would be probably cancerous in nature now in 25 percent of the pediatric cases there is an underlying pathology that causes a lead point like something which would just like you know uh, cause this motion of a part of intestine to the one now that thing is more common in those cases which are less than three months of age or maybe like more than five years of, uh, of age uh, which we call as a typical age now coming down to the to the lead point so what is a lead point uh, a lead point or some also called a lead point is basically a lesion inside the intestine so it could be any growth it could be any like sort of a diverticulum or anything inside the intestine that is usually trapped by the intestine moment and then is dragged to a distal segment precipitating into susceptible let's say there is like sort of a polyp or something so when they, there is peristaltic movement this polyp can become the lead point and then like you know it can lead to uh, or drag this part of intestine into the uh, distal one and then that would be causing telescoping which we call as uh, into susception now uh, if you see on my right side uh, there is a table which uh, displays uh, some of the uncommon conditions which are potentially associated with into susception so if you see mechal diverticulum which is a small pouch occurring in two percent of the population that can sometimes become a lead point and uh, cause into susception polyps like many kids have got polyps which are small like uh, benign growths in the lumen of the intestines that can act as a um, which call as a lead point lymphomatous masses lymphomas rare a rare condition but sometimes intestinal lymphomas can also uh, cause that vascular malformation angiodysplasias that can cause that and some of the parasites you know uh, worms especially entrobius vermicularis which are like uh, arthrom like uh, creatures living in the intestine that can also cause um, uh, this intersusception in rare cases hsp you know shonil purpura which is basically a vasculitis so inflamed vessels inside the intestines as they swell up they can act as a lead point Cystic fibrosis, you know, is an autosomal recessive condition uh, of the uh, of the childhood, and uh, that causes uh, repeated chest infections and exocrine pat pancreatic insufficiency, or oh, that can also uh, sometimes lead to into susception. And last but not the least, hemolytic uremic syndrome, which I discussed in my last lecture. I mean, that can also uh, cause into susceptions. These are some of the uh, rare associations. Uh, sometimes certain features of these illnesses uh, cause a lead point. Sometimes uh, it's just like related with one another. We don't know what actually causes that. Anyhow, by and large, so these are some of the conditions that can be associated with uh, into susceptions. If child comes into susception, 
make sure that you've got these things in your mind to see if there's any other associated uh, pathology. So what happens? All these things are associated with interception or it may be idiopathic. But once the interception develops, okay, part of the intestine is telescopy. So the mesentery is dragged into the bowel. So the, that part which actually attaches the intestine to the abdominal wall, that is also dragged into the bowel. And what would that cause? That would cause venous and lymphatic congestion. So when there is congestion, what would happen? That would be resulting edema of the bowel wall and as well as the uh, mesentery. And that can be uh, sometimes if you don't treat them that can lead to gangrene and uh, small bowel death sometimes they also they say well viral certain viral infections have been implicated as a precipitating cause because uh, evidence has shown that uh, in certain cases there was a preceding viral illness but the evidence is not definitive so we don't know whether there is a real cause effect relationship between the two but nevertheless there have been a small association now coming down to the presentation, how these uh, kids they present now. If I take you back uh, to your medical school teaching, so basically in pediatrics or maybe sometimes in surgery as well, the classically taught presentation is that there is sudden onset of intermittent severe abdominal pain. Uh, well, these episodes are cried are are marked by like crying. Uh, the child is hysterically crying, he's in distress and they occur at like 20 to 30 minutes intervals. They say that between these episodes, the child is said to have, uh, is said to behave normally. They say sometimes the vomiting can also occur as well and sometimes you can find a sausage shaped mass uh, which you feel somewhere in the abdomen and later on they might be having the what they call the red uh, current jelly stools. So this is the classical symptomatology which is written in the books. But um, well, let me tell you, I hate to break it to you, but these symptoms that are taught in the textbook, they are extremely unreliable, extremely unreliable. Honestly, in fact, I mean, uh, the, the triad of like what you say, like this abdominal pain, saucer shape, mass and current jelly stool occurs in less than 15% of the patients that's quite poor like I mean how would you uh, be relying on this symptomatology when it is present only in a very small segment of the cases um, so even when we talk about simple bloody stool uh, it might be only seen in 50% of the cases 25% may just have occult blood and occult blood you can't see with your eyes I mean you have to do uh, stool examination for microscopy in fact, I mean, nearly 20% of uh, these kids, they do not have any obvious distress or pain. And 30% of the patients, they do not pass uh, blood in their stool. So as I tell that, this symptomatology is extremely, extremely reliable. There's not one single symptom, you know, which can actually help you. Now, uh, again, perhaps I would say the least helpful, the least helpful, but the most common symptom that occurs in need to susception from practical point of view is what we call as lethargy. Yes, lethargy is a word that every pediatrician hates. But as the pathology progresses, this increasing lethargy it develops in the infants. And you know, lethargy is a very non-specific thing, like uh, more than 1,000 things can cause lethargy. But by and large, lethargy is the most common symptom, like irrespective of what have been, we've been taught in the textbooks, like abdominal pain, saucer shape mass, red current jelly stools, vomiting, things like that. So, uh, remember, in any child who's between six months to three years of age, who has got isolated, isolated and unexplained lethargy or altered consciousness or a child who doesn't look well, and you don't have any other explanation for that. I mean, he's not suffering from, let's say, any upper respiratory tract infection, or he's not suffering from other like invasive infections like UTI or something and that child you should be suspecting into susception. Now coming down to the diagnosis. Well I mean the definitive diagnosis done by abdominal ultrasound which shows you the target sign uh, but nevertheless uh, we should still take a very detailed history. I mean I told you that uh, I told you that 
history and physical examination are basically a wash but one should still ask about abdominal pain with episodes of crying vomiting or if there is bleeding pr and also about lethargy now when you're doing your abdominal or well, when you're doing examination to let me put it that way you should look for abdominal distension many of these kids would be having slightly distant abdomen still look for abdominal mass whether you find it or not and look for if there is any rebound tenderness or guarding because sometimes if it leads to perforation then obviously that the the abdomen would be very tense and hard now your differential list in a lethargic infant or a toddler with abdominal pain is quite long i mean if you look at the book there are so many reasons for a lethargic child or who has got abdominal pain uh, but uh, three other diagnoses three other diagnoses can also present with vomiting and bloody diarrhea that cannot you cannot afford to miss them number one is malrotation with volvulus so a child who has got malrotated uh, gut and that becomes like you know twisted on itself we call it vascular valvulus that is also a condition which is very very like severe can be life threatening you don't want to miss that so that can that should be on your differential diagnosis list so malrotation with volvulus Another thing which is a bit rare that is bacterial colitis. So like bacterial infection of the large intestine, bacterial colitis, uh, that should also be on your differential diagnosis. And the third thing is Meckel diverticulum, which again is rare. I mean, it's only a cousin 2% of the population. So Meckel's diverticulum, because Meckel diverticulum gives you like painless, massive uh, GI bleeds, lower GI bleeds with abdominal pain. So three things remember in the differential diagnosis malrotation with volvos number one bacterial colitis and number three meckel diverticulum now x-ray of the abdomen along with ultrasound should be performed in all suspected cases what x-ray abdomen number one followed by ultrasound now you would be asking why x-ray abdomen the radiograph does not diagnose into susception remember it's not for diagnosing interception. Very rarely, very rarely you'd be able to uh, see a target sign on the, uh, what you call on the abdominal x-ray. But it actually helps you in ruling out perforation and malrotation. So if there is any perforation and malrotation, you would see like, you know, um, sort of uh, air under the diaphragm and uh, you might see bowel, uh, what you call air fluid levels um, on the abdominal x-ray. So that's why you should be doing abdominal x-ray. Ultrasound is the uh, diagnostic modality of choice. They say in experienced tech, uh, if, if the ultrasound only is a tech is an experienced one, the sensitivity and specificity are almost hundred percent. So it's gonna pick up the uh, intussusception. So they usually see a target sign, okay, and that is hundred percent sensitive, hundred percent specific with a negative predictive value of 100%. So if a negative predictive value is 100%, you can simply say that a negative ultrasound definitely rules off into susception. So you can have any other reason, but at least not into susception. Now the classic finding on this uh, ultrasound scan is a target sign. So what is target sign basically? I mean, if you see this target, you know, you know when you are playing that game. So target sign are basically layers of intestine within the intestine. So because obviously it's telescoping so that gives you a sort of a donut sign or a target sign whatever you call it so that is the classical uh, ultrasound finding on uh, in, in a case of into susception now how do we manage these charts depends whether they are how well or unwell they are those who are acutely ill with unstable vitals like they're they are in shock or there are signs of perforation because you see gas uh, under the uh, diaphragm or there are air fluid levels. And these, uh, let's say, leading to perforation, uh, that would need surgery. Perforation requires surgery because that bowel might have to be resected if it has died or uh, the uh, hole in the intestine needs to be closed. Other non-emergent reasons for surgery include if, let's say, the non-operative reduction is unsuccessful. So if we have given the air contrast anima or an old is barium anima, if that didn't work, then obviously you will go for surgery, especially if there's a persistent focal filling defect on imaging, which is concerning for our mass lesion and blockage. So if that's the case, then obviously surgeons have to open, pediatric surgeons have to open up the abdomen and do the necessary. Patients who have got no perforation will undergo a non-operative reduction via hydrostatic or pneumatic pressure by any. So these days, 
either air contrast enema or water contrast enema is used I mean depending on whichever expertise is available in whichever hospital um, anima reduction also has got a high success rate well high means like 70 to 85 percent but yet it, do, it does carry a small risk of perforation uh, the best part is that no sedation or anesthesia is needed for this uh, type of uh, procedure uh, the air animals, which we also call pneumatic animals, they carry a slightly higher rate of success than the hydrostatic one. But again, as I told you, it depends on your institution, depends on your trust, depends on your hospital, uh, how much expertise you have got in this particular procedure. Uh, success rate of uh, non-operative intervention is lower than uh, is lower in those who have got delayed presentation and those with that identifiable lead point. So if somebody has got an identifiable lead point and those who have got delayed presentation then the success rate of these procedures is slightly lower than those who haven't got these conditions. Important point are that no antibiotics are needed in successful cases. So if you have successfully reduced it, no antibiotics are needed because again, evidence have shown us that they are not found to be helpful. As far as diet is concerned, the diet may be quickly advanced to clear fluids after the procedure and beyond that if the child is able to uh, tolerate that. Now, as far as the uh, recurrence rates are concerned, total recurrence rate in those cases which have been successfully, you know, reduced non-operatively, like let's say either by air contrast enema or by hydrostatic enema is 10 to 20%. So 10 to 20% cases can have total recurrence. Now, over 50% of these like recurrent cases that would happen occur in the first 72 hours. So strict return precautions are recommended. I mean, you safely you can uh, discharge the child within 24 hours. But as I told you, in those 10 or 20% where the recurrences would happen, majority of them would happen in the first 72 hours. So you just tell them if the symptomatology returns, they have to immediately come back to the hospital. Remember. Now, remember if... Another important point from, uh, from exam point of view is that remember recurrence alone is not an indication for surgery. If a recurrence has occurred, it doesn't mean that you definitely need to open up the abdomen. No, you still will go for the other procedures. Yes, surgery, as I told you, have got other indications. Now, asymptomatic intersusception is can also uh, happen and it's usually or what I would say occasionally discovered uh, while other studies are being done okay and these are managed conservatively with no attempts at reduction so if it is asymptomatic into susception and you incidentally find it and the child as well no attempts are made at reduction because spontaneous reduction of these into susceptions occur frequently so they may frequently occur and like you know reduced on their own nevertheless clear constructions for observation and when to return for further evaluation should be provided to the parents remember so you have to Tell them that in case if there is any symptomatology, abdominal pain, vomiting, distension, especially lethargy or crying episode or something, they have to immediately return back to the hospital so you can further evaluate these cases and do the uh, necessary procedures, whatever might be required in those cases. So this was all about intussusception. Uh, so in this particular lecture, we talked about what is intussusception, what are the common conditions which are associated with intussusception, why it occurs what are the common uh, clinical presentation and uh, how do we treat intussusception. So I hope you have liked my this video. Uh, please do share it with your friends. Um, if you have got questions, please feel free to ask me. Uh, and um, last but not the least, have a very good day. Take care. Bye-bye.